Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Cassandra webinar. I am delighted today to welcome Patricia Gawler uh, from The Last Pickle. Uh, if any of you were in London at the Cassandra Summit back in October, you would have heard uh, Patricia present there, and uh, her presentation is available on Planet Cassandra. So. Uh, Patricia is joining us today from The Last Pickle. Last week we had Aaron Morton presenting, and um, Patricia works very closely with Aaron. And um, just a couple of housekeeping items before I turn over to Patricia here. If this is your first webinar and you would like to ask Patricia a question, please use the Q&A tab inside of WebEx. Don't use the uh, instant messaging functionality, please just use the, the Q&A functionality. And uh, we will reserve about 25 minutes at the end of the presentation to get through just as many questions as we can. Um, so Patricia, are you ready to go? We will uh, hand over the ball. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really, really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Christian. Uh, I'm, I'm also excited to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about bulk loading data into Cassandra uh, and what, what the different use cases for that um, uh, are and, and also what, uh, what other considerations to take in mind when doing so. Uh, so a little bit about the last pickle. So we're a Cassandra consultancy uh, from, uh, 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 from a very diverse background, as you can see, and we, we work with clients to, to build up Cassandra solutions uh, and based all over the world. Uh, so let's get into it. So, so why would you want to bulk load data in the first place? Why is this feature useful? Um, and there are a number of different reasons. The first use case that, that often comes up is running performance tests. So you have your cluster and you want to see how it will handle a five terabyte load. Uh, and you can very easily do that by just generating data uh, and then running your test across the cluster. Another use is to migrate historical data into uh, your Cassandra cluster. So we, we run into these situations a lot where people are moving, uh, moving away from a different sort of database uh, and they have five, five, six years of historical data that they need to uh, they need to add into their Cassandra cluster. Um, it doesn't make sense to 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 write, route the data uh, through all of their business logic. Uh, so instead, we can just directly bulk lo bulk load that. Uh, and then finally, uh, bulk loading is also useful when you're changing topologies. Um, uh, when you're changing exactly uh, how your cluster is is strategized. I will talk. We'll talk a bit more about um, uh, about that later on. Uh, so, so we're we're first going to go over how data is actually stored in Cassandra, what the right path is, and then we'll look into th three specific case studies to look at each of these use cases that we talked about, uh, and then we'll we'll talk a bit more about uh, um, other considerations to keep in mind. So, when a write comes into Cassandra. Uh, the, the write is first written to the commit log and the mem table. And for now, we're only going to focus on what happens uh, on the mem table side. Uh, so the writes are stored in sorted order on the mem table. And then eventually, when the mem table reaches a certain size, uh, that um, uh, the mem table is flushed out into SS tables, uh, which are sorted string tables. Uh, and each each SS table is immutable, uh, so it, it cannot be changed once once it's created. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that you'll notice is that oh well, doesn't that mean that as your node uh, lives, you get more and more SS tables? Uh, that's true. And the the number of these SS tables are reduced through a process called compaction. So that is the basic. Uh, that is the basic gist of how, how writes come into Cassandra. Um, uh, so when we, when we take a look at what a sorted string table actually is, uh, the SS table is basically just a list uh, or a collection of, uh, of files 
or components as they're called. And so the, the main component in an SS table is the data, uh, the data component. And so as you can imagine, the, the data component contains all of the data for, um, uh, for Cassandra, for uh, that particular SS table, as well as all the information for the other components. Um, the index component uh, contains, a, uh, contains an index of the row keys. So, so this just keeps track of where each row key is in the SS table and the offset from where the data starts. Uh, the summary component, uh, the summary component contains a summary of the index, as you can imagine. Uh, and this is, this is distinct uh, from, uh, uh, from the index interval that you set in the Cassandra.yaml file, and that this is specific to the SS table. Uh, and then finally, the filter, uh, the Bloom filter, uh, the filter component contains the Bloom filter for each SS table, and it's this Bloom filter that um, uh, that tells you whether or not uh, a certain key uh, could exist in this SS table, which reduces the number of uh, the number of disk seeks that you have to do when when putting forth a read. Uh, and then finally, the the table of contents. So this this just contains all of the uh, a list of all of the components, um, and any custom components that you may add would also be included in the TOC. Uh, so now we'll we'll take a look at generating uh, generating dummy data and why you would want to do this. Um, uh, so again, if you have your cluster and you want to test out what your configuration can handle, um, or you want to test out uh, certain lat latencies in your application, a, a good way of doing this is is just generating uh, generating data and then filling that into Cassandra. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's often useful to simply bypass the um, uh, bypass the the write path entirely and just load SS tables into Cassandra. Uh, and so so each of each of these examples, each of these these examples that we're going to be looking at, uh, we are we're writing out SS tables directly. Uh, so when when you want to set up uh, when you want to generate the dummy data. Um, uh, it's very simple. So on the cluster that you need to you need to load the data into, you create the key space and you create the column family. Uh, and so right now we're looking at how to do this with Thrift uh, as opposed to CQL uh, because it's it's a bit simpler to start off with Thrift. And we'll talk a bit later about how how to do this in CQL. Uh, but so basically we just set up uh, we set up the key space and we set up the column family. Uh, and then, um, then for each uh, for each column family that we want written out, or for each SS table that we write, we we set up a new uh, a new SS table simple and sorted writer, which is which is in Cassandra, um, and we pass in the directory, uh, what kind of partitioning it needs, uh, key space and comparators, and and a few other pieces of information. Um, and so for, for this example, we're going to use the ASCII type comparator. So, so strings are going to be, or the data is going to be uh, sorted alphabetically. Um, and then we'll also specify uh, what size uh, of SS tables we want, uh, we want to write out. Uh, and, and, and one more thing, so, so with, the, with the size of SS tables, it's important to, it's important to keep in mind that you, you don't want your SS tables to be too large, um, uh, because then it, it, it's just more difficult to load them in, but you also don't want them to be too small, because then compaction has to kick in uh, and, uh, and work harder to, to, um, uh, to compact all of these SS tables together. Um, and so, so now what, what we're going through here in this file is we, we go through and we create, uh, we create just a random string, a random uh, string of bytes. Pardon me. Um, and, uh, uh, and basically we just walk through um, and for each column, for each number of columns that we've specified, we walk through, we put in the random data, uh, and then we reset our position uh, in, in our byte buffer uh, of the random string. 
the random ASCII. And, and one thing that you'll notice, uh, since we're resetting the position each time, uh, we only generate the random, uh, the random data once. And so this, uh, this allows us to, uh, to more efficiently generate data so we're not making a call to generate random data each time. Uh, and then when we, when we take a look at the SS table that's been created, so you can see that, that the SS table has been written to the my key space um, uh, slash my column family directory. Uh, and this is because SS tables are stored um, uh, as directories within directories by key space and column family. Uh, and we can, see, we can see all the components there and we can also see the data component is the largest component which, which we've expected. Uh, so now when we want to load in the, the SS table that we've just created to our local cluster, uh, so keep in mind we've already set up the key space and the column family in, um, uh, in Cassandra, uh, and so now we can just run the SS table loader tool. Uh, and so when we run the SS table loader tool, we make, uh, we, we point it to where the data is. We point it to the directory that contains the key space and the column family. Um, uh, and then, uh, and then we can see that the um, then we can see that the SS table loader starts streaming data to our to our node. Uh, so this is a one node cluster right now. If we had multiple nodes, we would see that that um, uh, we would see all of the nodes in our cluster listed for this, uh, listed under the streaming. The relevant part of, of the, the key space and data too. Um, uh, but for now, since we only have one node, we are only streaming to that one. Um, and uh, we can also see that our one node cluster does contain um, uh, does contain the token range that we're writing to, uh, and uh, and the data is being sent there. So a few things to keep in mind when you're using SS table loader. Uh, so you'll want to run these commands on servers that are separate from Cassandra. This is sort of a no-brainer. You, you just don't want any uh, possibility of contention for resources on your servers. Uh, and secondly, uh, one thing you might want to do is throttle the command if you see that your cluster is getting overwhelmed. Uh, so so you, to SS table loader, you can pass in an optional dash dash throttle command uh, and, then, uh, and then send that down to 120 megabytes or whatever your streaming, uh, your streaming limit is. Um, and, and then also, you can also parallelize the processes to make this run faster and make this run against more of your nodes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our final example. Uh, so now we're going to look at backfilling historical data. So, so again, we when we have the backfill problem, we we run up against uh, we run up against issues where where companies have uh, companies have these data sets from uh, from their years of being in business, and they want to move this into Cassandra. They want to make it searchable. They want to have all of this data available to their application. Um, uh, but one of the problems that, that they run into is that they can't put the data through their, through their application logic because it, it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't, uh, uh, it would simply take too much time. Uh, and so, uh, in a lot of cases, it's just not necessary. Um, uh, you can, uh, you can move over your data, uh, and write it directly to an SS table. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that that the data now has to be denormalized. So, so one thing that we'll take a look at here in, in this code is that um, we are moving over data from, uh, from an order table that originally had um, uh, an orders table, a customer orders table, and we're moving that into separate, uh, separate column families in Cassandra. Uh, and so so you can see, so we, we iterate through our orders and we add them to the customer orders column family and then we also add them to the orders column family. Um, and so other than that, the, uh, the process is very much the same. 
uh, as uh, uh, as the previous example in that we're we're simply just adding data. And so here we're not going through dummy data. We're we're just going through a CSV or whatever format that our data is provided in. Um, and and now finally we'll talk about uh, changing topologies and what that looks like and and how you would um, uh, why you would want to do this. Uh, so we we run into uh, we run into some cases where uh, where people want to set up a QA uh, cluster that mimics their production system, uh, but this QA system does not need um, does not need to have uh, six or twelve or whatever the the original size of the production cluster. It doesn't need all of that horsepower, and so you can just run your other system on a much smaller system. But how do you get how do you get that data uh, that data into the cluster? Uh, well, the first thought is, well, you could just add in the new nodes uh, into the cluster and then create it as a separate data center and then then cut that off. But but uh, um, but if you're trying to mimic your production cluster, then you don't want to uh, you don't want to add any outside uh, influence that could um, uh, that could change or that could affect your production system. Uh, and so one one solution to get around that is to uh, use the step that we've outlined before and um, and simply uh, take a snapshot of all your data uh, and then upload that into your your cluster uh, so so one thing that we'll look at that we'll look at here is is we're looking at a QA system uh, that has six Cassandra nodes um, and so we call we call the FS table loader uh, again on the same key space and column family. Uh, and we call that against three of the nodes picked randomly. Um, uh, and the the first thing uh, the first thing that we can see is that data uh, data is being sent. Uh, so data is being streamed to all of the nodes, um, uh, but data actual data is only being sent to a few of the nodes. So just to dive in a bit more about about the difference, so you can see uh, you can see that data is streaming to cast one through cast six. Um, so the FS table loader basically goes; it looks at the data uh, it looks at the data in the FS table, uh, and it it looks at each uh, it looks at each row key and where uh, where that fits in the token range. Um, and so then. What SS table loader does is it goes through and matches up the row keys to the new token ranges. So, for example, um, in this case, we have in this SS table that we're that we're streaming, we have data that is being sent to the new token ranges that lie on Cas one, Cas two, and Cas six. Uh, so, one one interesting point about this is that now all of a sudden. You have uh, you have the option to be able to target um, uh, target different parts of your system. So if you if you know that the data that was originally uh, that was originally from the snapshot is only being sent to these three nodes, you can then find uh, another bit of data. You can f then find another snapshot to target nodes CAS three through five. Uh, and then you can also keep track of the progress. Uh, by looking at the the total percentage that that is being uh, that is being transmitted. Um, uh, one thing to keep uh, one thing to keep in mind as you're going through this is you'll want to you'll want to keep a close eye on compaction stats. Uh, so ideally, um, they should stay below a hundred. Um, uh, depending on the type of system that you have, depending on whether this is production or QA, you can you can probably afford to uh, to crank up that threshold a bit more and just run uh, run these commands against these systems. Uh, and so now now we'll take a look at uh, some other considerations that you'll want to keep in mind when um, uh, when trying this out with CQL3. Uh, so, so with with CQL, you have the need to keep the schema consistent. Um, but the 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 
the difference is, is that CQL does not provide, um, it's not quite a one-to-one -one mapping from, uh, from the examples that we showed you earlier to, to how it's written in CQL. Uh, so CQL um, uh, uses a composite comparator. And because of that, you need to write your data using the composite type. Uh, so, so in our examples uh, in the previous slides, instead of using, instead of just creating a new column um, and, uh, uh, and then adding in, uh, adding in a, a byte array of data, uh, instead, what you'd have to do is actually use the composite type builder um, and, uh, uh, and create the composites as CQL would to be read out. Um, uh, and and that's, that's basically the only difference uh, because all of the SS table uh, will load in the same way. Um, uh, and so, so with that, um, uh, just to recap, uh, SS table loader uh, or loading your SS tables directly is a great alternative to uh, to going through and bypassing uh, the write system and adding in data quickly and efficiently to your cluster. Great. So, Christian, are there any questions? There are loads of questions. Loads of questions. Perfect. So um, I'll take uh, one up front. Uh, Patricia's webinar recording will be available tomorrow on Planet Cassandra. So if you would like the slides and uh, to review anything, again, that uh, we post the slides and the video. So um, buckle your seatbelt, Patricia. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, are, are you ready for a slew of questions? <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, Nitesh asks, um, XML is written as text. How is XML search supported? And then actually has a little follow-up to that. Is it worth creating secondary indexes on the whole of the text field that stores XML? You know, I'm not sure actually. Uh, um, so, so in this one, we're we're writing out the data as bytes uh, and and not as XML. Uh, and so, so if we're using Thrift, um, uh, you you're still going to have to write out the data as bytes. You're still going to have to pass it through as bytes. Um, uh, so, I'm not exactly sure where where XML search comes in. Uh, if you want to email me. Uh, uh, afterwards, I, I'd be more than happy to talk to you more at length about this because it's it's a bit it's a bit trickier than uh, uh, than just adding in a secondary index. And that is uh, Patricia at thelastpickle.com, correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Or, or hit or hit you up on Twitter. The uh, Patricia's Twitter handle is on uh, on the Twitter, slide right now. At Patricia Gorla. Okay, uh, George asks whether you have a test script to flex a, um, and, and I believe this is the correct number, 22,000 node system, cluster performance. Do you have a test script to flex a 22,000 node system? Do I have a test script to flex a 22,000 node system? Um, uh, as a part of this presentation, no. Um, uh, if you want to send me a message, this one is also a bit more more involved. Um, uh, no, but I'd be more than happy to, to talk to you about that. Okay, great. John asks, is this SS table loader part of the Cassandra package? Maybe you can talk about how people can get the SS table loader. Yes, so that's that's a that's a great point. So so at the table loader is a is a tool that that's in uh, the bin directory of Cassandra, um, uh, and uh, uh, the composite type builder, the simple at the table and sorted writer, and and a few other packages that I referenced. Those are all in directly from the Cassandra Apache Cassandra project. 
Great. Um, and then George may have to contact you one on one as well, but I will uh, read you this question. Uh, so George asks, um, right now he is moving historical data uh, from a relational legacy to a columnar compressed all flash array data store, 14 petabytes of data. Do you have the tools pre-written to make this happen? Uh, so using uh, using SS table loader and writing out SS table. So uh, uh, no. So each each case is is basically a, a custom uh, a custom delivery just because uh, of the data that you have. Um, uh, the script needs to be uh, specific to the data that you're writing out. Okay, great. We're we're getting through these. That, that's 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 good news. A lot more to lot more to come. Grab a glass of water. Michael asks, how do you partition your historical data before writing to local or the local FS tables? So I believe the the question is how do you how do you determine what is historical data before you write it out so you can only pick out uh, you can only pick out the FS tables um, the the short answer is that you you can't. Uh, so so when you're when you're taking a snapshot of the SS table, well, I guess the the real answer is it depends. When you're taking a snapshot of your SS table, you can't you can't say uh, I only want to segment this part of the SS table. You you have to take a snapshot of the whole SS table. But uh, if you're trying to pull back data from Cassandra, you can filter by date. Uh, depending on your data model, um, or find some other way to segment for a particular section of your data. Uh, but generally, the historical data that, that we've seen with clients uh, has, um, uh, has been in a separate system entirely, and so all of the data has, been, uh, has needed to be migrated over. Um, uh, perhaps another, another way of, uh, uh, of of picking out your historical data from the recent one uh, is if, if you've had running backups, uh, you can take a look at a particular backup section uh, and, uh, and go from there and use that. Okay, great. Um, more on mimicking. Can you provide a step-by-step -step process, please, as an example? Um, could, could you repeat the question more on mimicking? Min, mic, min, M I N M I C I N G. I may be pronouncing that wrong. Min, mic, I'm, I'm afraid George, I don't understand uh, the, the question. Yeah, George, you can you um, can you rewrite your question and maybe give us a little bit more information, and then uh, I'll, I'll repose that one. Uh, Nitesh asks, when using bin SS table loader. MyKS CFD local host in a three node cluster, would it load data into only one node or will it uh, load it into all the nodes? Will it distribute the data? No, so as this table loader will distribute the data to all of the nodes that, that contain uh, uh, or that own the token ranges for the new data. So if I, if I go back to, uh, to this example here, so you can see um, let's see. Uh, you can you can see that data is being sent to uh, to all of the nodes, all of the nodes in the system. Um, but uh, you can see that connection is being made to all of the nodes in the system. But actual data is only being written to. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, actual data is only being written to three of the nodes. So as a table loader, what it does is it is it goes through, it looks at each row key. Uh, and it looks at the cluster and looks at, at the token ranges uh, that each node uh, that each node uh, owns. Hi, Patricia. Did we lose you? Yes. Hello. Hi. I think you voiced out there for a second. We lost you. Oh, so sorry about that. Um, uh, uh, so just to just to recap, so as the table loader, uh, it uh, uh, it sends it makes a connection to all of the nodes, 
um, but only sends data to the nodes that contain the token ranges for that SS table. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so uh, next one. By the way, loads of people saying um, thanks for a great talk. Ramakrishna asks, can SS table loader be used with PIP? Uh, with PIP? With PIG in Hadoop. Oh, with PIG. Um, I, the, so, so PIG is a, is a, is a high-level query language uh, over, um, uh, over a particular piece of data. SS table loader uh, just loads SS tables into Cassandra. So they, they have two, two completely different realms. Uh, you can certainly load your SS tables into Cassandra and then run your queries uh, uh, on PIG over over that data in yes, data stacks. Yes. Um, Natasha asks, can you give an example of a network topology cluster load using CQL and SS table loader? Can I give an example of a of a network topology load uh, with CQL and SS table loader? Um, uh, so CQL uh, um, wouldn't really play a factor. So an example of a network topology load is you have uh, two separate data centers um, uh, that you want to uh, you want to replicate. Um, uh, and that you want to duplicate into a smaller system. And so you, you can go through, set up another multi-data center cluster, and then, uh, and then send the, uh, uh, bulk load the data in using, uh, uh, using SS table loader. Um, the data will still go through, uh, even though it's in, uh, even though it's in a separate data center. Okay, and uh, Michael asks, when you say not to keep SS tables too big, how, how big is that? How many megs? It really depends, uh, to, to be honest. Um, uh, you, you don't want to keep, uh, you don't want to make the SS tables too big as to make your bloom filters inefficient. Uh, I don't have an exact number on that. It, it really depends from system to system. Okay, great. But, but generally, like a good, um, uh, uh, you know, 500 megabytes, uh, 200 megabytes of what, what we've been writing to for, for tests. And so that's just when you're generating dummy data, though. With, uh, um, uh, with the other methods, you don't have as much control over the size of the SS tables. Although, um, uh, although I will add, when you're, um, uh, when, you're taking, uh, when you're taking a snapshot of data and you want to load that in, I, uh, you'll want to make sure that compaction is running smoothly and that, um, uh, and that your, your, uh, your SS tables have been compacted into smaller SS tables or into fewer SS tables because that the fewer the SS tables, the simpler it is to, to load them all in. Okay. Uh, Felix, do you have any recommendations for switching between tables after loading a new table version as an SS table? Do I have any recommendations for loading loading a new table version? As for, opposed for, to switching, for, for switching between tables after loading a new table version as an SS table. Oh, so um, uh, so with with uh, um, uh, with uploading um, multiple column families um, on multiple SS tables, uh, um, uh, one simple way of doing that is just writing a bash script that goes through and iterates through all of the possible column families that you have. Okay, and uh, Jaga asks, uh, are there any connectors that can be used to move data from relational database systems? Um, 
are there any connectors uh, to move from relational to Cassandra? Uh, so off the top of my head, um, uh, I'm not sure. That's that's something that I'd uh, that I'd be happy to look into, but that's something that I'd have to answer offline. Okay, but great. Generally, um, so uh, some of the uh, so some of the. But Christian, if I if I may this, add to that, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. If I may add to the the, the previous question, um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of databases allow you to export your data in a certain format, or uh, you can pull out the data uh, as a CSV. Uh, so there there are different ways of of going through going through the data. Great, yes, and and Jaga, there are also uh, connectors written by some of the BI vendors. Um, for example, I know Pentaho has a connector, so you can find those on the partner page on datastacks.com, uh, and there may be some good information for you there. Um, Michael asks, for pending tasks, target um, is less than or equal to 100. How did you determine 100 as the upper limit? Could you repeat the question, sorry? Yes, and I think this goes back to uh, one of your slides. Um, for pending tasks, target is less than or equal to 100. How did you ah. determine 100 as the upper limit? Uh, so for the, for the cluster that we had set up, we were, we were basically looking at what's, what is a general uh, a general number of compaction tasks before the before the cluster starts to have uh, uh, starts to have delays, or the compaction ta tasks start to have an effect on the cluster. Um, generally speaking, a hundred is a lot. Um, uh, your compaction should be running fairly close to zero. Um, uh, so, so that that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from Tom. Could I use SS Table Loader to, to move data from a smaller cluster to a larger cluster using the backup snapshots of the SS Tables from the smaller cluster? So if you're upgrading clusters, then, then the, the easiest thing to do will likely be to just add in new nodes into the cluster. Uh, and uh, and allow repair uh, to uh, uh, to stream in new data. Uh, SS table loader is is most useful when when that isn't an option, uh, and when uh, um, when you when you want to move in uh, a large amount of data. As, as you can see, uh, you can run into issues with compaction by using SS Table Loader. So if you have the option to just add in add in new nodes when you're upgrading the system, then I would go with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sentil asks, can you give some insights on using TTL, Time to Live? Um, so, so when using when using TTL, uh, so time to lives aren't aren't exactly germane to to this talk. Um, uh, there's not there's not really a um, uh, uh, there's not really a benefit or a disadvantage to using them with SS Table Loader. Um, if you mean just more generally uh, about using TTLs, then I um, uh, feel free to message me, and, and I'd be happy to uh, uh, to talk with you more about that. Okay, great. Uh, Sri Krishna asks, can we test this in our local environment with code samples? Yes, you can. Um, uh, so a lot of the initial testing was just done off of my laptop with uh, with adding in uh, adding in data into the system, um, uh, taking a snapshot and then loading it back in, generating the data and then loading it in. Um, so as for as for actual code samples, uh, these slides will be posted up later. 
Um, there, there is some, uh, there is some configuring that you'll need to do, but I'll, I'll look to see if, if we can make some of that code available. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Ursula asks, what's the best way to bulk load uh, from one CQL column family to another column family with a different schema? The one has a single row key to a composite row key. So if you're moving if you're moving from one data model to the next, you'll need to rewrite the data completely. Uh, so if you want to do a bulk load, you you can, but you'll need to go through the data, uh, put it into the the correct structure for the new data model, and then bulk load that in. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jack asks, is, is is there a Python library for SF table loader? Uh, I'm not aware of a Python library for SS table loader. Okay, we can get back to you on that too. We can we can yeah. do some research there. Um, can you provide high level details of migrating an Oracle schema to Cassandra? So may, maybe just more more generically here about uh, you know my migrate how you should think about maybe your data model as you migrate off a relational system. Yeah, so so when you're when you're migrating from any relational uh, any relational model into a non-relational model, there are certain things that you need to keep in mind. You need to uh, keep track of uh, um, uh, how do I denormalize my data? What does my new data model look like in Cassandra? Uh, how will I migrate all of my data from Oracle to Cassandra? Um, and what it, what is the process for doing so? How do I uh, how do I continue how do I continue to keep my system up while I'm migrating this data? Uh, so those are those are the first steps that you need to ask before uh, before migrating. Okay, and uh, Sriram asks, how is a JSON stream handled in Cassandra bulk load? Uh, how is a JSON stream handled in Cassandra bulk load? I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand the question. Um, uh, could you uh, could you add in more more detail to that, and and I'll, I'll think some more about that. Okay, we'll see if uh, Sri Ram gets back to us there. Uh, okay. Oh, I've got a lot of questions, Patricia. It's good. Um, Okay, this is a two-parter from Brian. This may be a one-on-one, -on -one too. It's pretty specific. We have a bulk load solution which bypasses SS table loader, and SS table directly to Cassandra using um, EMR, Elastic Map Reduce. It's much faster. Mm -hmm. We are currently having difficulty with the resulting SS table. The Bloom filter doesn't appear to be created correctly. Any ideas? That's the first part. Tell me if you want to take that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so with uh, hmm. if you're if you're creating the SS tables directly yourself, then uh, and your your Bloom filter appears to not be created correctly, then a good place to look would be how is your SS table being initialized. Uh, the components are all created, um, uh, including the filter component, is all created uh, with the SS table, and so that that would be the first place that I'd look. Uh, without any more detail, I, I can't uh, I can't say further, um, uh, but I'd be more than happy to talk about that more offline. Um, uh, but so so I would look at how is the SS table being initialized. And then the, the second part of that uh, also, where is the level information using level compaction? And how does one control this when writing an SS table? So the level information is in, uh, I believe it's in no tool CF stats. Um, I, uh, but the, uh, and, and that shows up if you have leveled compaction on that column family or not. It'll show you the 
the different levels and how many um, uh, in what how many uh, compactions or how many SS tables are at each level. Um, uh, so as for controlling it when writing an SS table, um, that that really depends on the compaction parameters that you've set up into place. Uh, and it, it doesn't have any say when uh, when you're actually writing the SS table. Okay, uh, Danny asks: Is there any version compatibility issues that we need to be aware of when using SS Table Bulk Loader to load data from an older version of Cassandra into a newer version of Cassandra? So this would depend on the version of Cassandra that you're using, uh, or how old is old. Um, uh, I, I do remember there were some issues with 1.1 and, and early 1.2 series of bulk loader, um, uh, but 1.2 and up that you shouldn't run into any issues. Uh, and certainly from 1.2 to 2.0, uh, there are no uh, there are no problems with uh, with uh, sending over the the SS tables. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Pavan asks, uh, while moving data from one Cassandra cluster to another cluster with a different number of nodes, do we need to set up SS table loader on a completely separate instance, which is not a Cassandra node? Uh, yes, so you will not want to run as a stable loader on your Cassandra on your Cassandra instance, uh, and that's just a, a good um, uh, a good rule of thumb is you don't want any contention for resources for Cassandra. Uh, so you want to keep that as separate as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, and then does bulk, this is Liam, does bulk loading of data with SS table loader work if the data already exists on a cluster for a given key space and common, column family? For example, doing a bulk refresh of data from an external source. Hmm. Hmm. Does the bulk loading of data work if the data already exists on the cluster for the given key space and column family? So, so um, uh, this, this is a great question, Liam. Uh, so, so the the question then is, uh, um, what happens to the data when it's uh, when it's sent over to the cluster? Um, uh, the ride will still go through. Um, uh, that that does work, but any any data that that is there before uh, will get overwritten um, by the same data. Okay. Um, Pavan asks, do we need to repair data after using SS Table Loader? Uh, do we need to repair data after using SS Table Loader? No, um, uh, no, there's no need to to run repair. Um, uh, repair and compaction will will start to occur naturally in the system. Okay, thank you. And uh, Michael asks. By the way, I think we we have time for maybe um, five more questions here. <clears throat> we'll see if we can get through them all. Uh, Michael asks, where does the sorting occur since the writer is unsorted? Is that overhead expensive? Is it possible to pre-sort and use a sorted writer? Hmm. Uh, so, um, so, it, so it is possible to pre-sort and use a sorted writer. Um, um, But the sorting, where does the sorting, sorting is based on tokens. Um, uh, and if, uh, if that overhead is too much, uh, then, then you can use a pre-sorted writer. Um, uh, the unsorted writer is, uh, uh, is the default. Um, and so, so if you start to, if you start to notice issues with that, then you can switch over to, uh, to a pre-sorted writer. 
Okay, great. Um, I, I can take this next question. Raju asks, is there a good tutorial available for setting up Cassandra and importing the data from SQL Server to Cassandra SS tables? So I don't know of a good uh, SQL Server to Cassandra um, tutorial specifically, but on Planet Cassandra, there are lots of resources available about setting up Cassandra. And then also there is a section where people have migrated from um, SQL Server to Cassandra. So I could always connect you um, with uh, someone in the community that's already done it, and they may have some best practices for you. So you can hit me up on Twitter um, at chasker, C-H-A-S-K-E-R, or um, via email christian at datastacks.com. Feel free to reach out. Um, <clears throat> I have question for you, Patricia. I have table A, and I use SS mm -hmm. Table Loader to load a similar table B. Is there a way to rename the new table B to A? Uh, no, you, you can't rename, uh, rename tables. Uh, you'll, have to, you'll have to create a new table with a new name. OK, perfect. Um, Paige, this is a, a note for you, by the way. Uh, people are putting in their email addresses for Patricia in the Q&A. Maybe afterwards, you could go through and uh, pull those out. Um, I'm seeing George and uh, Natash here. So uh, maybe you could shoot those to Patricia afterwards. Um, so. Can we append data to tables using SS Table Loader? So SS Table Loader loads up uh, the SS tables to the new cluster, um, and and th this is this is an interesting point to bring up. Uh, uh, the SS tables uh, do not contain the entire the entire table; they only contain a portion of that table. Um, uh, and even the rows that are in each SS table may be spread out over multiple SS tables. Um, so rows will be spread out over uh, over SS tables on a single node, and tables or column families will be spread out over multiple SS tables um, uh, per uh, in the cluster over the SS tables over the nodes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prasanna is asking, can you explain how bulk load impacts staged event-driven architecture? Um, well, so, so stage, could you repeat the question? How bulk loads impact stage event driven architecture? Architecture, um, yes. Bulk loads, so the, the bulk loads use, uh, use a streaming repair, uh, use a streaming repair, um, and it's not, not using stages. Does that, does that help? I, I, I think it probably does, yes. Okay. Um, Ash asks, are there any techniques available for upserts? Find the row if existing based on an ideal ID field and update it and then insert a new row. Uh, so this is actually something that, that a lot of people um, uh, start wondering about Cassandra when, when they start using it or moving away from a different database. So Cassandra does not have upserts. Uh, Cassandra does not have updates. Every, every, single, um, uh, every single insert into Cassandra um, or deletion is an insert. Uh, it is a write. Cassandra is an append-only system. Um, and uh, uh, it's through processes like compaction and repair that, that data is brought into an eventually consistent state. Uh, so for an upsert, so that is something that you would have to implement on the client side. Um, although uh, read before write is uh, is an anti-pattern, uh, and if there are ways to avoid doing that, then um, uh, then that's usually the best way forward to to use your Cassandra cluster efficiently. Okay, thank you very much, um, Paige. Could you put up the uh, next webinar and all that stuff? I will go through that. Um, Patricia, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Great presentation. 
again, lo loads of comments on, on uh, how succinct it was. So thank you very much. Look forward to uh, having you back again soon. Uh, so upcoming webinars, April 3rd, uh, mark your calendars, Cassandra at Lithium. Lithium is uh, a, an enterprise social platform. Uh, they're doing some very exciting things. And then May 1st, building applications with the Cassandra Python driver. That's by Eddie Satterley, um, who is from Splunk. We will be adding other webinars as well. Um, very often, so uh, please check back. Uh, I imagine there will be um, updates added to both datastacks.com and Planet Cassandra. Then if you are interested in presenting at this year's uh, Bay Area Summit or attending, mark your calendars. It's September 10th and 11th, and the call for papers is open uh, now, so please feel free to submit your um, questions or your abstracts. And then if you have any questions for us, you can um, hit us up at info at panicassandra.org. And then one last uh, little thing here. If you would like to continue your Cassandra education, we have uh, free online training courses. So the uh, URL is on your screen there. So Patricia, thank you again. Any any last words from you? Uh, thanks again. I, I really appreciate um, you all being here and, and uh, listening to the webinar. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at patricia at thelastpickle.com or via Twitter at, at Patricia Gorla. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great uh, day, and we will email you when the video and slides from Patricia's talk are available.